Welcome to Destination History, where we tackle interesting and fascinating places and take a stroll through the history behind them. Welcome to the second part of our deep dive into a place so good it just couldn't fit into one episode. If you haven't listened to part one, then head on back an episode and check that one out first. Otherwise, you might feel a little lost. Today's destination will see us traverse the theories, the war, stone care, and how seeing the stones has changed over time. Join me as we take a look at today's destination, Stonehenge Part 2. Stonehenge is a unique prehistoric monument that really stands alone in its sophistication, architecture, and time. It's been heavily studied across the centuries and has therefore had its fair share of theories about the who, why, and when. These theories have included Danes, Druids, astronomy, religion, and of course, aliens. What's a good theory without aliens? Even though Stonehenge's original purpose, or perhaps purposes, has been lost to us, the stones still do play a significant role in today's society, holding religious and cultural significance for many cultures and groups in the modern world. In the 1960s, there was some controversy surrounding Stonehenge and the field of astroarchaeology. It was mainly kicked off by the book Stonehenge Decoded, written by Gerald Hawkins and published in 1965. Previously publishing his theory in the journal Nature, Hawkins posited that Stonehenge was a Neolithic computer for predicting eclipses. Atkinson was horrified and replied to this theory with a rather scathing review which he titled Moonshine on Stonehenge, but it didn't really do much to the popularity of the theory, especially not once TV celebrity and professor of astronomy and experimental philosophy out of the University of Cambridge, Sir Fred Hole endorsed the astronomical observatory theory the following year. The theory was still being supported by some in the field of archaeoastronomy well into the 1970s when Alexander Tom also thought lunar observatory was a good use of the stones. When speaking about the early theories put forward for the reason of Stonehenge, Jaquetta Hawkes viewed Stonehenge much like Batman. Every age has the Stonehenge it deserves or desires. Neolithic computer wasn't the only theory put forward. Throughout the 1960s and 70s, several theories were swimming around about the original purpose of the stones. One of the more interesting is Eric von Daniken's proposal that aliens were the culprits in his book Chariots of the Gods, which popped up around 1968. See, I told you, aliens. A pretty much by chance excavation ended up taking place in 1979. It started because Prince Charles wanted to pop around and check out the stones. While they were waiting for the royal helicopter to land, the Department of the Environment noticed that a couple people were digging really close to the hill stone, which stands at the end of the avenue. The Department of the Environment hadn't authorised any digging work near the stones, so it was quickly investigated. Turns out the old posties were out there laying telephone cables and had somehow been given permission to dig near the stones without the proper authorizations, which usually include a full-on archaeological investigation that goes along with it. Thank God for Mike Pitts, who was the curator of the Alexander Keeler Museum at Avebury. He was able to put together a team quick smart that were mainly made up of students and staff thanks to Arthur Up Simon out of the University of Southampton. The results of the dig turned out to be pretty worthwhile. The team discovered that the Hillstone may well have had a partner in crime. They found a large hole nearby that was just the perfect size to fit another Hillstone. This brought into life the possibility that these two stones may have framed the rising sun on Midsummer's Day when looking from Stonehenge itself and would probably also have lined up with the Slaughter Stone and its partner as well. Everything just seems to be coming together. As we know, between 2003 and 2009, the massive project that was the Stonehenge Riverside Project was led by Mike Parker Pearson, which really focused on the River Avon and its significance in relation to Stonehenge. Pearson put forward the idea that the wider landscape was split up into zones. 
with Stonehenge being a zone for the dead and the monuments found over Durrington Walls being a zone for the living. Even though not everyone was on board with this zone theory, the project did find some pretty cool results that fitted nicely into their hypothesis. Probably most fitting was the discovery of houses that seemed to form part of a village near Durrington Walls. This discovery seemed to answer the long-standing question of, where did all these people live? The houses were dated to about the same time that it's believed Stonehenge was being built, so of course the natural conclusion is that this must have been the builder's village. We've seen this throughout history before and even in the present day. The people who are doing the building need somewhere to eat and sleep, along with potentially their families. The remains of the houses were reburied to preserve them, no doubt, but you can actually visit a recreated one over at the English Heritage Visitor Centre if you're ever nearby. Check out the link in the show notes if you're currently unable to travel. We also already know about the Stumble Preseli project led by Jeff Wainwright and Tim Darvel. They had their own theory about Stonehenge. They figured the place was one of healing, especially because of the presence of the blue stones that were known for their healing powers. The healing powers of the blue stones were actually noted by Geoffrey of Monmouth in his Historia Regum Britanniae, where he mentions that the stone's healing powers were activated when pouring water over them as the sick bathed, which we know from earlier does give the blue stones that blue colour. Here's Wainwright explaining how they came to the healing conclusion. The pieces of the puzzle came together when Tim and I looked at each other and said, it's got to be about healing. Well, isn't that an epiphany moment? But it seems that not everyone was really on board. Here's what Mike Pitts has to say about it. The idea that there is a prehistoric connection between the healing properties of bluestones and Stonehenge as a place of healing does nothing for me at all. As far as I'm concerned, it's a fairy story. Good grief. Tell us what you really think, Mike. 2002 proved to be a pretty big year for the Stonehenge landscape when the Amesbury Archer was found. New techniques were able to identify that he originally came from an alpine region. General consensus is Switzerland. And this find proved to be one of the richest graves dating to the Bronze Age that has been found in Britain. Buried with the archer were several grave goods, including flint arrowheads, copper knives, and gold ornaments found in the hair. The grave is believed to date to 2300 BC, which means that those hair ornaments were among the earliest metal objects that have been found in Britain. The fact that the archer came from continental Europe means that the powers of Stonehenge must have been known internationally, especially if the archer was only in Britain in order to visit Stonehenge and wasn't there just by coincidence. The discovery of the Amesbury Archer really only furthered the theory of Stonehenge as a burial ground, and this is generally agreed upon by most modern scholars. While they're yet to decide if the place had other purposes, or even how the thing was built without the modern technologies we enjoy today, I'm imagining very slowly, a general agreement as to its wider purpose is a step in the right direction. It seems that Stonehenge will always be surrounded by an air of mystery and intrigue. While our understanding about the stones has changed and grown over the last several decades. Here's a last word from our mate, Wayne Wright. I think what most people like about Stonehenge is that nobody really knows why it was built. And I think that's probably always going to be the case. It's a bloody great mystery. Back in the day, between where the current visitor centre and the actual stones stand was actually a First World War airfield. This was where trainee pilots would practice their flying skills and get comfortable in their planes before they were sent off to the Western Front. The Salisbury Plain has actually had a long history with the military, especially the Air Force. Even though there was an aerodrome near the stones for the purpose of the First World War, it wasn't the first time the area had been used for flying machines. All the way back in 1897, the War Office had actually been buying up the land near Stonehenge. They were attracted by the isolation factor of the area and had used the space to conduct training exercises. Military balloons were pretty popular in the area in the 1880s when Royal Engineers were using reconnaissance balloons when taking part in exercises. 
A pretty exciting thing to have come from the ballooning exercises is that in 1906, an aerial photograph of Stonehenge was taken, and it has actually turned out to be the earliest known aerial photograph not only of Stonehenge, but of any archaeological monument in Britain. Pretty impressive. As we head into 1909, we see the introduction of the first aeroplanes to the area when Horatio Barber, a civilian aviation pioneer, decided to grab a bit of land which is now known as Lark Hill. He ended up building a shed to keep his plane safe and performed a couple of test flights. But it would only be a year later that the military would move in and build what would be the first aeroplane hangars or military aircraft shed. After some seriously heavy bombing raids by the Germans on British soil in 1917, it was decided that Britain seriously needed to up their air force game. And that meant more airfields, especially for training. And Stonehenge was one of the lucky new airfields to be added to the British military effort. In fact, at the beginning, the airfield near Stonehenge was an RFC training site. But from the start of 1918, it was actually the top school of aerial navigation and bomb dropping and was the first stage of a pilot's training before being sent off to the Western Front. While the school hung around until towards the end of 1919, it was interesting to think that the powers that be seemed to not be concerned at all about the prospect of potentially permanently damaging the prehistoric monument. While the aerodrome was only around for about four years, once the war had ended, there were calls for it to close and by 1921, the military aircraft that had been stationed at the aerodrome had all left. And once the aerodrome was finally closed later in the year, the whole place was given back to its original owner. Shortly after, there was a public appeal and the aerodrome and associated land was given over to the National Trust, which then went ahead and set up the Stonehenge Protection Committee in 1927. By the time the 1930s rolled around, all the buildings that had been erected for the aerodrome had been taken down, returning the landscape to as close to pre-war as it could. Even though the stones weren't significantly harmed while the aerodrome was in place, it was the very existence and close proximity of the airfield that first sparked the debate about whether Stonehenge should be restored or not. The debate also waged around what was acceptable to be added to the landscape. It was actually only relatively recently, in the late 20th century, that the land immediately surrounding Stonehenge was turned into pasture. Even though the aerodrome at Stonehenge only had a brief life, it was pretty essential in the timeline of Stonehenge, especially since it played an important role in transforming the Stonehenge landscape into what we see today. Since the 12th century, Stonehenge and the surrounding land had been privately owned. The Antrobus family were the lucky ducks to have Stonehenge in their possession, and probably lucky for the Henge, they had taken some steps to protect the monument. They set about appointing a warden in 1822 to oversee the stones, and by the time the end of the 19th century rolled around, there were instructions and steps in place that aimed to protect the stones and surrounding landscape from major damage, like campers setting up fires, littering, bits of stone being chipped off for souvenirs, and that horrid pastime of graffitiing names which in this case meant scratching them into the stone themselves. But all was not protected. As 1883 came around, Stonehenge was lucky enough to be included in a list of monuments that were to be protected under the new Ancient Monuments Protection Act. But Sir Edmund Antrobus was against the act from the outset, and seeing as the act needed the permission of the landowner, Stonehenge was out. December of 1900 wasn't the best time for Stonehenge. One of the upright sarsens fell, breaking its lintel in two. Seeing how dangerous this was, not to mention the permanent change to Stonehenge, it really kicked off a change in attitude when referring to the stones. In response to all of this, a fence was put up around the stones, and in order to take a look at them close up, you had to pay a newly appointed entrance fee not to mention the police constable that was brought in to make sure everyone was doing the right thing. Eventually, the Antrobuses sold off the estate in an auction in 1915, and lucky for Cecil and Mary Chubb, they were able to snatch up Stonehenge. 
Cecil wanted the stones to be protected under the aforementioned Ancient Monuments Act, and so in 1918 he wrote a letter to the one, the only, Sir Alfred Mond, who was the first Commissioner of Works. Here's a snippet of what the letter had to say. I offer this unique possession to you as a gift to be held for the nation. Sir Alfred was pretty excited to finally have hold of the stones. He saw the monument as something of unique importance. And when he passed on the terrific news to the King and PM, they apparently both expressed their deep appreciation. It became official at a presentation ceremony in October of 1918 when a deed of gift was signed over. And it really didn't take long for the Office of Works, which preceded English Heritage, to begin taking steps towards major conservation efforts. As we know, they set about writing fallen stones, carrying out extra excavations and conducting massive surveys. Once the horrors of the First World War had somewhat receded, the Office of Works set about producing an incredibly detailed survey of the stones. It contained a detailed account of each and every stone and the angles at which they stood. A program of restoration was set to begin in 1919 And this is where Lieutenant Colonel William Hawley comes into his own. Although the Inspector of Ancient Monuments, a one Charles Pears, is said to have said, in relation to the restoration program, And anything that could possibly be considered as smartening up of this venerable monument, carefully avoided. So it seems that the work to be carried out was only to be for those stones that posed a real threat to falling. If they were leaning but stable, they stay as they are. There really is an argument for leaving the effects of time on a piece. It shows it's lived a full life. So the work got started in 1919, and by the time it was brought to an abrupt end in 1926, Hawley had only explored about half of the interior of the stone circle. But there were always problems that plagued the restoration project, mainly that of erosion and time. Two of the stones they erected were leaning in a way that the lintel had twisted, meaning that it no longer fit once the two upright stones were returned to their original position. Not to mention that once the uprights were removed from their leaning position, there wasn't actually any indication of where they had been originally. And so the final position was up to what Hawley thought was best. Very scientific. Again, because of erosion, it was feared that the tenons wouldn't fit into the lintels as snugly as they should, so lead caps were created from recycled lead off the roof of the Hampton Court Palace to ensure a snug fit. But Piers, the chief inspector, decided that this was not necessary at all, and the process was not repeated again. But pretty cool to think that a part of Hampton Court Palace is at Stonehenge. Everything's connected. The restoration team were also set on re-erecting one of the trilithons that had fallen back in 1797. And even though the assumed reason for the stopping of the project as a whole was that the money had run out, it was probably a little more likely that Piers didn't think the straightening up of these stones was necessary, probably with little archaeological evidence in favour of straightening. Once Hawley has packed up in 1926, there was actually very little excavation activity at Stonehenge for about 30 years. But that didn't stop the attention being turned to the surrounding landscape. The World War I airfield buildings were still standing at this time and were apparently an eyesore in contrast to the beauty that is Stonehenge. So, as we know, the aerodrome buildings were finally demolished around 1930 and a lot of the land surrounding the stones was bought up by the National Trust. As we move into the late 1930s, concerns was growing to the damage being experienced by the monuments surrounding Stonehenge. Rabbits were having their way with the barrows, and the National Trust were intent on planting trees. The horror. And as the Second World War neared, really the rabbits were the least of their worries. Australian soldiers had to be strictly told to stop digging holes in the Cursus Barrows, and it was even suggested that the whole area which made up the Stonehenge Triangle, which consists of the land between Stonehenge, Woodhenge and Blue Stonehenge, should be ploughed as farmland to help in the war effort. 
Luckily, Piers came to the rescue once more and was able to make the Wiltshire War Agricultural Committee see how foolish that idea really was. Oddly enough, the Stonehenge Triangle is the exact shape of an isosceles triangle and appears to have used Pythagorean theorem a couple thousand years before the bloke was even born. Convenient? I think not. Check out the link in the show notes if you want to know a bit more about it. Restoration and excavation would slowly start up again at Stonehenge in the 1950s. The Society of Antiquaries brought in three blokes that we met earlier, Richard Atkinson, Stuart Piggott and J.F.S. Stone. They wanted them to write a pretty complete history of Stonehenge and its archaeology. In 1952, R.S. Newell, an archaeologist who had been conducting small excavations in and around Stonehenge, had started a campaign to get its restoration back up off the ground. He even got a wealthy someone to finance the whole thing. But the Ministry of Works was incredibly resistant to any more fiddling with Stonehenge's appearance. They liked the ruined look and figured the whole thing would just be too difficult to get it back to how it was meant to look in the Neolithic period. But then the next year, along came Atkinson, Piggott and Stone. And for some reason, the society backed their proposal for restoring the stones, especially the fallen trilithon. In a kick to the guts for Newell, the ministry said this when accepting the trio's restoration proposal. It would enhance the value of the monument for the student and make it more intelligent to the ordinary visitor. So, in 1958 and 1959, Atkinson, Piggott and Stone got together and set about writing the trilithon that had laid on its side for about 162 years. But they didn't stop there. They also set some of the larger sarsens in concrete to prevent them falling in the future and also straightened about six blue stones that had also fallen over time. But not everything was smooth sailing. In 1963, one of the stones in the outer circle fell during a long period of frost followed by high winds. The thawing and heavy rain from the weather had weakened the ground in which the stone sat. Naturally, the whole site was thoroughly inspected, especially because it was feared that more stones may fall on the visitors that could still wander in and around the stones. Every month, intricate details were recorded, which showed that the Great Trilothon and a couple others nearby were actually moving. So a final phase of restoration was carried out in 1964, which basically began securing the moving stones in concrete and re-erecting the one that had fallen. And it was in 1964 that the restoration project came to an end, and it was this that was the last major excavation at the site. And oddly enough, the research from the excavations remained unpublished until 1995 when everything that was collected in the 20th century was published as a whole, even though a couple of the drawings had been lost. Since then, only small investigations have been allowed to take place, but larger ones have been allowed to go ahead in the surrounding landscape, especially in terms of improving the roads. A summary of this landscape work can be found in the publication Stonehenge and its Environs that was published in 1979 and is actually still useful and relevant today. It was this publication that displayed the richness of the landscape surrounding Stonehenge, but it also explained the damage that the landscape had endured, particularly due to modernisation and cultivation. And off went the Stonehenge Environs Project, organised by Wessex Archaeology, that sought out to assess what damage agricultural development was doing to the place and figure out ways to prevent any more of it happening, while keeping as many people as possible happy. The results of the project's hard work were published in 1990 and also included a prehistoric environmental sequence for the area, which was figured out using snail remains. The difference in species gives indications as to the state of the environment and landscape. Pretty impressive stuff. As the 1970s and 80s roll our way, we see Stonehenge being a popular spot for those of an alternative lifestyle, especially around the solstices when crowds would appear for the Stonehenge Free Festival, which allowed festival goers to camp around the site for weeks at a time. But the Henge itself was suffering. The antisocial behaviour was not good for it, and this wasn't really in line with protecting the site. Tensions between those coming to Stonehenge for spiritual reasons 
and the authorities finally came to a head in the now famous Battle of Beanfield in June 1985. Earlier, English Heritage and the National Trust had gone to the High Court and had been given an injunction to prevent the festival from taking place at all. So, naturally, police set up roadblocks and exclusion zones in place to prevent people from turning up. Barbed wire was even put up around the stones. Seems a bit extreme, but okay. Then down the road comes the Peace Convoy, made up of vehicles and about 600 people all heading towards the monument. Naturally, they were stopped at the roadblock and pretty much it devolved from there. The police said the vehicles were trying to ram the roadblock and the people said the police were violent first. The whole affair went on for a good several hours and in the end, some were injured and 537 were arrested. What a fun, peaceful day that must have been. For the next couple of years, similar but smaller protests continued as Stonehenge remained closed to the public at the time of the solstice. It actually wasn't until 2000 that the monument was once again opened up for summer solstice rituals to take place. Obviously, the whole thing is highly managed, but it seems to be working and still happens today. It wasn't until 1983 that the government thought that a whole department was needed for places like Stonehenge, and so the Historic Buildings and Monuments Commission was born, more formally known as English Heritage. It took Stonehenge under its newly formed wing in 1984 when Lord Montague of Bayview was the chairman. But Stonehenge wasn't its only responsibility. It oversaw the care and protection for a whole range of historic places in Britain, and I suppose it still does. English Heritage's main aim is to better these historic sites with guest and tourist facilities, inform and educate those guests and tourists through displays, signs, and of course, interpretation. 1986 turned out to be a pretty fun time for Stonehenge and its surrounds. The prehistoric landscapes of Avebury and Stonehenge were formally added to the UNESCO World Heritage Site list due to their international importance. The World Heritage Site covers an area spanning 6,500 acres, so there's plenty to talk about there. While several improvements were made, especially in its landscape, there were also problems that needed serious dealing with, namely the visitor facilities at Stonehenge just weren't cutting it and hadn't been for some time, not to mention the havoc that cultivation and agriculture was still having on the Stonehenge landscape. And so in 2000, a new management plan was put together that recommended that those parts that were particularly sensitive be returned to natural pasture. Amazingly, everyone did their part, and between 2003 and 2011, the local farmers were able to restore 25% of the whole World Heritage Site back to grassland. Now that's what it means to work together. While this work was going on, the Stonehenge Environmental Improvements Project got together and were able to provide a new WHS management plan in January of 2009, which, from what I can gather, is doing pretty bloody well. When motorways and the railway were added to the English landscape, especially those leading to Salisbury, Stonehenge saw an influx in visitors. Of course, we know that originally there was nothing stopping visitors from walking right in amongst the stones, and when that sarsen fell in 1900, there was serious concern for the safety of those having a little walkabout. As we head into the 1930s, we see the number of visitors increase to more than 15,000, stopping by Stonehenge in one month. Admittedly, it was a midsummer month, but still, That's a decent amount of people looking at some rocks. Of course, this bump in numbers was attributed to the increase of people owning cars, which allowed those people to get out and about for a day or a weekend. And what better place for a day trip than the British countryside? Up until this point, there had only been one single custodian, and the poor bloke was getting seriously overwhelmed. By 1935, cars were blocking traffic as they attempted to enter the area surrounding Stonehenge, so a small car park was added on the opposite side of the road. But this small space wouldn't really do a whole lot for very long. It was also around this time that the Stonehenge visitor experience was bumped up a level and the site museum was put in one of the excavation huts used by Hawley and his team. 
But this spot didn't really work. The hut had a bad habit of leaking, and so the stuff displayed in the museum had to be moved to Salisbury Museum for safekeeping. Now, the Stonehenge Cafe was a controversial addition. It popped up in 1927, about 360 metres away from the actual stones. Even though it provided a service to the visitors, it wasn't universally liked. Here's a memo from the Office of Works regarding the cafe. It's a cheap, flashy little building which vulgarises unspeakably this world-famous and most impressive monument. Hush words for someone just trying to earn a little money. But objections to its presence prevailed in the end with the small building being knocked down in 1938, despite the fact that it was probably exactly what visitors wanted, especially in an English winter. The publicity around the excavations and restorations that took place throughout the 1950s and 60s only encouraged more and more to visit the prehistoric monument. And the popularity of programs like Animal, Vegetable, Mineral, and even Atkinson's own program, Buried Treasure, only increased the interest around archaeology. Stonehenge was starting to experience an influx of visitors and attention. And along with those visitors came more cars and more need to cater to those visitors' needs. In 1950, the National Trust graciously allowed a mobile tea bar to set up shop in the car park, a far cry from the cafe that had pride of place 18 years earlier. New underground lavatories weren't added until 1954, and by the time we get to 1960, the car park was finally extended. But a much larger problem was the havoc thousands of feet were doing to the interior of the stone circle, which basically turned into a bog in winter. Initially, the interior was resurfaced with gravel around 1963 in an effort to protect any archaeology that lay underneath. Then the area was managed and harder wearing gravel mixed with bits of concrete was added, which actually helped to level the ground and is what stuck around for the next 20 years. And it's a good thing this was done when it was, because by the time we get to the 1970s, Stonehenge is seeing about half a million people pass on through a year. In 1966, the car park was once again extended, and an underpass was built to provide safe and easy access to the stones. And good thing too, because in the late 60s and early 70s, solstice celebrations really started to take off again. In 1974, a free stoned henge festival was promoted and did fairly well with it coinciding with the summer solstice. The next year, the crowds were bigger and the tradition lasted for about a decade. 1977 saw a fence introduced which closed off the stones to visitors. You could look at them from afar but not wander among them. The Department of Environment had some serious concerns about the ground erosion that was taking place from all those feet especially because by the end of the 1970s, the numbers were only going one way and it wasn't down. The next year, so in 1978, the graveled area within the circle was removed and returned back to its original grass and a path that moved around the stones was surfaced so that visitors wouldn't wear out the ground underneath. In 1993, the Parliamentary Public Accounts Committee took a good hard look at the appalling facilities available to those visiting Stonehenge and labelled them a national disgrace. And they were too. Not enough toilets and a tiny seating area that masqueraded as a cafe? Ridiculous. And it took quite a few years for them to figure it out too. Wasn't until 2013 that the new visitor centre was opened at the edge of the World Heritage Site, so about 2Ks from the stones. The building was designed by an Australian firm, Denton Corker Marshall, and features an undulating roof with thin steel columns. Houses a glass cube where you can find the cafe and gift shop, and a timber box is in there as well, containing the museum. Quite a step up from what was there before. But while the visitor facilities have improved, the road situation has not. The idea to widen the road was quickly shut down because it is inside a World Heritage Site. You can't just go around widening roads wherever you like. All the way back in 1998, the idea of a tunnel was put forward and pretty much everyone thought it was a pretty good idea. Everyone welcomed it. English Heritage, the National Trust, even all the major archaeological bodies. Plans for the tunnel have even been drawn up. 
It would be 2.1 kilometres and along with the closure of the A344, which has actually been recommended by UNESCO due to its close proximity to the stones, it would remove roads from the centre of the World Heritage Site altogether. Happy days! But alas, we are now in 2021 and there is still no tunnel. So it's rather like bullet trains in Australia. Today, or in a pre-COVID world, you can find nearly a million people stopping by Stonehenge every year. It's much like an icon, not just for our prehistoric past, but also for those modern Druid societies that take inspiration and identify with Stonehenge. The Stonehenge that we see today isn't complete, but completeness in this sense doesn't matter. It's almost all the more loved because it is incomplete and its origins masked behind a veil of history. There is so much information out there on just these particular stones. Forget about the other stone circles that have been found all around the world. If this has piqued your interest, do some of your own research. Check them out. Learn what you can and if you find something interesting, definitely let me know. I'd be hella interested to hear about what you find. And that brings our two-parter on Stonehenge to an end. Thanks so much for joining me as we strolled through the history of Stonehenge. Wasn't it exciting? You know the drill. If you want more exciting stuff, check out the website for images and links to more cool things over at destinationhistorypod.com. And if you want to hear about a particular place or building, then send through your suggestion by whatever means possible, and it will get its very own episode here on Destination History. See you next episode.